Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Saadi Awinat. Uh, I'm the CTO and the Global Services Lead in EMC. It's a great pleasure to be with you today and participate in the second uh, e-government summit in Kuwait. Um, yesterday in the opening ceremony, uh, we have heard so many speeches, keynote speeches uh, from both the local entities in Kuwait and the global multinational companies. And it was very obvious and common thing among Eve everyone that they are emphasizing uh, on the point that we are now witnessing a major disruption in the ICT industry. We're very familiar that every 10 to 15 years we witness such disruption to the ICT uh, industry that changes the way we deal with IT. And we all remember how mainframe was so disruptive to the ICT industry and then the PC era, how innovative it was to the personal computer, the client server architecture, all the way until the internet was born. And during those, this type of innovation, wave of innovation, as I said, we have witnessed significant impact to the ICT. Though the one that we are living now and witnessing now could be the most destructive, the most disruptive one in the history of ICT. And the reason why I believe so because it's not impacting only the ICT. It's also impacting each and every single aspect of our life. The personal life, the social life, the economical, and even the political, as we have seen over the past few years. In this platform that we're living, the boundaries has been removed, and we are no more or no longer dealing with our company only and with our customers. And now we are shifting to a new platform that has no boundaries. IDC calls it the third generation platform that consists of billions of users and hundreds of millions of applications. And in this new platform, the third generation platform, as my colleague explained yesterday and today, we are seeing four key elements that is changing, that are changing the whole game that we are having now. We're seeing mobile becoming the dominant way of accessing data and computing. And we're seeing cloud computing becoming the default architecture in IT. And we're seeing social media invading not only our personal life, it's also invading the business. And most importantly, we're seeing data growing at an exponential rate, a data rate growth that we have never predicted that it will be reaching. In the future, we believe that everything will be connected to the internet in what's called internet of things. Not only the mobile or the tablet, our connected cars, our home appliances, our smart cities, and even our human bodies will be connected to the internet through the wearable, the smartwatch from Apple, or the augmented glasses from Google and others. And all of them will be collaborating, connected over the internet. Cisco, they predict that by 2020, there will be around 50 billion things connected to the internet. And many analysts, they say, think that this is very conservative and the actual number will exceed 200 billion things. So imagine in the future when we have 200 billion things, human and non-human, connected permanently to the internet. Imagine how they're gonna communicate among each other. Imagine how they are gonna collaborate. And what is the size and the speed of the data that they will be generating and consuming? As a matter of fact, IDC predicts that the size of the digital universe by 2020 will reach 44 zettabyte. My colleague mentioned 40 zettabyte. So it could be 40 or 44. IDC predict 44 zettabyte. And when I first heard the zettabyte, I could not understand how big is zettabyte. 44 zettabyte is equivalent to 44 trillion gigabyte. This is a massive number of data. And this represents 50 fold the size of the digital universe that we had in 2010. So we're saying that in Four or five years from today, our data will explode to reach 44 zettabytes in the digital universe. And Gartner believed that the nexus of those four forces 
cloud, mobile, social, and big data is creating a new era of computing. And this innovation and this disruption is causing business to face structural changes. It's not only impacting, as I said, IT. It's also impacting business. And we're seeing all industries being impacted by this wave of innovation. IDC again predicts that by 2018, one third of the top 20 market leaders will be facing substantial competition from new companies that are using today the third platform. And at the beginning when I heard this number, one third of the top 20 market leader, I, I was like a bit, it's not, it's too big to, to believe that in four or five years from today, one third of the top industry will vanish. They will not be anymore the market leader. But when I take an example like Uber, the taxi company that came out of nowhere, in 2009, it was established. And currently, it has no cars. It has, does not pay salaries of drivers, though the latest valuation of Uber was estimated to be $17 billion in five years. And this is by far ahead of all other taxi companies, including government-owned taxi company. And this is just an example of how innovation can bring new industry player that did not exist before. Another great example that I would like to share with you is Tesla. Tesla is an all electric car. It's a software managed car that you can, through your mobile application, control the car fully. Yes, you can do opening the doors and turning the AC or lowering the AC. You can do so many things controlling the car with the application. But more importantly, the promise that such technology is giving that this will make the cars configurable, upgradable. So imagine that after I buy a car, that I want to do an upgrade for the car. I want to go, for example, to the Saudi Arabia next weekend. And when I want to upgrade my car to become a four by four car. So all I need to do is to go to the mobile, subscribe with Tesla, new batch of upgrade, I pay $500 or something, and they push a new upgrade to my car over the internet, and suddenly my car became a four by four car. So this could be a dream. Some people, they might say that this is too dreamy. Some of you may say, I'm not, I'm not. This is a close future. And last year and nowadays, Tesla, they are pushing upgrades in critical situation. So imagine if we have a, a storm, snowstorm, or it's, they can push an upgrade to the car to increase the height of the car from the road so that water cannot flood the car until three days and then they bring it back to the normal situation. Imagine if we can do this for the wiper of the car when we have a storm. So that makes it more efficient, more practical, and more useful to us. And this is not a dream. This is a happening as we speak right now. And the promise is endless. And sky is the limit when it comes to innovation in this. And this represents the changes that we are seeing in the industry. Some players, they have seen this is happening, and they managed to adopt the change. The best example is Samsung. Samsung used to be an appliance company, used to manufacture washing machines, refrigerators. Now, they are number one in producing mobile. Last year, they sold twice the time that Apple sold in terms of mobile devices. But at the same time, some companies, they did not manage to succeed in this change, either because they did not see the change happening or because they did not have the agility to respond fast enough to the change in the market. And the best example is Kodak. We are all familiar with Kodak. Kodak was number one when it comes to photography. As a matter of fact, they were printing nine out of 10 
photos printed in the US were printed on Kodak paper. Now they have filed bankruptcy. And the reason why they are no longer in the business because of the threat coming from digital camera introduced in 2000. And what made it even worse to them when the cameras got embedded in the mobile phone, no one were interested anymore to buy Kodak cameras or print photos on paper. But what's really ironic in this example is that the threat or the source of Kodak going bankruptcy, the digital camera, was first invented by Kodak themselves back in 1975 by an engineer working for Kodak called Steven Sosa. He was the first to invent the digital camera. Yes, it was like five kilo kilogram and big and storing data on cassette, but they were the one who invented the digital camera and the executive of the company decided not to continue investing in this because that is going to threaten and cannibalize their business of photography. So you can imagine such change and decision from business management failing to adopt and embrace the technology. What could be the results to the business itself? And the common thing in all the examples, whether successful or failed, is that they could not do it without IT. IT has been the success partner for them. It is part of the business. And it's not only to support the business plan. In many cases, IT are the one who are responsible for introducing new business model and put on the table innovation. And this cannot continue or this cannot be presented if we continue working with the same IT mindset that we have right now, that we have silos of IT infrastructure, that we have kind of slow response to the provisioning of IT services, the pressure and the demand that we need to be agile. We need to have converged infrastructure. We need to have full automation and be responsible and responsive when it comes to provisioning the services. And this is easily said rather than done. Because the biggest challenge that we are facing as IT is that we need to do more with less. We need to come up with innovation to generate revenue, though we need to maintain our cost low. And we need to manage the risk and we need to manage the growth. And we are the superheroes that we are required to do all of this. And to be honest with you, this cannot be accomplished using the same traditional way of managing IT. Whatever we are used to manage IT over the past years will not be good enough for us if you, will manage, if you want to manage the future, the IT of the future. And that requires us to transform ourselves as IT. That requires us to deliver IT as a service. And when we say delivering IT as a service, we refer to the IT competing for the business within the organization. We're referring to IT innovating fast and be relevant and aligned to the business. And that requires substantial change within any organization. And this is not an easy, as I said, done. It's a journey that requires investment and in time and you become more and more matured with it. In our opinion, we believe that there are expeditors. There are things that can help any organization, government or business or social, to become faster in reaching their destination and goals. One of those expeditors, expeditors are cloud, is cloud. Cloud computing. But the first thing that we ask ourselves when we talk about cloud, what type of cloud are we referring to? Are we talking about private cloud or public cloud? Is it social? government, personal cloud, or is it a combination of all of these? And that is the question that we need to answer and address so that we can align our strategy ahead of us. And in order for me to explain to you how we best can tackle this issue, let's go back and see the history and how the cloud started. We are very familiar with building our data center in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even in 2000 with the traditional way 
that is physical centric data center. We purchase servers, storage, network gears, and we allocate them in our data center for application. And this is how we are, we're used to manage our data center up until mid of 2000, where a new trend came into the picture and there were service providers making substantial investment in technology in building infrastructure and building on top of that services for organization to consume, be it infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service in what's called public cloud. And we're all familiar with Salesforce examples of CRM. And we're all familiar with Amazon services for hosting and managing computing services. And what the, that created to IT is that we started to see huge gap between what we offer within our enterprise versus what is available on the internet. That gap put a lot of pressure on IT department because suddenly the power started to shift from our side as IT to the consumer, to the end user, and they start to see other things that are dynamic, that are flexible, and they can consume services on demand. So why IT is coming always with an answer, no, to my requirement. Why it's always taking time to provision services and why it's always rigid and unflexible while I can get it from outside. And this is what created pressure on IT to respond to this because we could not ignore it. We could not just close our eyes and say, nothing is happening. Public cloud is not gonna impact me, it's there. Maybe telco will be impacted, but me as a banking industry, no way. Me as a government, hell no. I am secured, I'm very comfortable in the way I'm managing my data center and operation, but that was not the case. And IT were forced with time to start responding to this. And the best strategy that we came up with was to transform our infrastructure to a more virtualized and automated data center that is well managed under our control within our comfort zone in what's called private cloud. So private cloud represented a natural evolution of our traditional data center into a more reliable, trusted, controlled, flexible, that has a lot of the features of the capabilities that public cloud service providers are offering. And that represented a major success for us as IT. Though, although it's closing and bridging the gap, but still limited us from leveraging the value of the public cloud. And we were working in silo, in isolation. Yes, well-managed, efficient infrastructure, but we are not leveraging any of the value coming from the other world, from the public cloud, and they are good. The offerings are available, that are available are good, and dynamic, and cost-effective. And it would be really nice if we can merge the benefit of both, if we can have both words, the good of both words together. And that was the promise and the challenge that IT has, is the ability to have a seamless way, transparent way, to alternate and leverage the value of both private and public cloud in a seamless, transparent way. And this is what is called hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud represent the most efficient way of managing my data center in a private cloud, yet benefiting and enjoying from what is available outside in a seamless and transparent way. And most importantly, based on my choice and my decision, based on my agenda, not anyone else's agenda, so I make the decision what's good for me to remain within my private cloud versus shipping it to the public cloud. And no one else can tell me that this is good for you or not. I am the master and the decision maker with that. So this is in simple way summarizing how cloud computing and the different deployment models of cloud computing. And the question that you, can, you might ask yourself where should we start? And what's our best strategy for adopting cloud computing? And as I said, the, if you did not start yet, the best thing to start with is to build your own private cloud, to transform your infrastructure to become private cloud model, which has 
certain characteristic of self-service provisioning, auto elasticity, dynamic, all of this. And once you do that, you will be among the majority of stakeholders and customers that are following this approach. According to IDC study, the vast majority, 81% of customers in the Middle East will be adopting private cloud strategy and architecture. And in order for you further to do this, we believe that this journey starts with standardizing on x86 platform and then building virtualization on top of that so that you can now remove dependency between applications and physical hardware. Suddenly become applications become agnostic to the hardware that it resides on and then enabling automation. And this should not be limited only to the server and computing that we are all familiar with. Because computing and virtualization of server is step number one only. The promise is that we need to extend this across the whole technology stack within our data center. That means that our storage has to be standardized, virtualized, and automated. That means that our network layer has to be standardized, virtualized, and automated. The same applies for our security and management. With this, we will be able to remove the silos that we have right now in our data center, that having a complete technology stack for my Windows environment, for example, and having another complete technology stack for my high-performance computing. And instead, what we need to do is to abstract the intelligence from that physical hardware and represented it to the business application to leverage in a way that we can leverage the value of pooling, abstraction, pooling, leveraging, and automating that kind of infrastructure. And this is what we call the EMC, the Software Defined Data Center. The data center that is managed by software, that the upper hand and the full control reside within the software. And that makes us free to automate. And that makes us free to innovate and leverage the value to the max to the end users. So the software defined data center is the future for data center. It's the core of a private cloud. And it adds a lot to the server virtualization that we are familiar with, as I mentioned. Because we are not limiting ourselves only to servers. We are extending this across to network, storage, security, and management. And some people, they say, why should I bother with all the results that we have from server virtualization and the beauty that we have gained and the speed and the responsive that we had in provisioning servers? Why should I bother? And I would challenge this by saying, in the old days, we used to provision server in months because we used to procure servers and drag them and power them and configure them, that takes months. Yes, with virtualization, it takes minutes. But when you think about it, it's not really minutes because after you provision the server, you need also to provision storage for that. And that takes a couple of hours or days. And you need also to provision certain network, IPs, schemas, and when it comes to security, you need to make sure that you create proper VLANs and proper security zoning for your application. And you need also to worry about data protection and whether it should be packed up daily, weekly, monthly. And how about the disaster recovery? Should I ship the data to my secondary data center, DR or not? And when you start adding the time and the effort that we are incurring in this process, the minutes start to shift to days and weeks. And we are going back to square zero of defeating the value and the purpose of virtualization that we had in computing in today's. And this is the promise that software-defined data center is giving us to push back that timing to minutes. So with the software-defined data center, we will be able to fully virtualize, fully automate, fully provision services in minutes rather than days or weeks or months. And this is again the core of the future. 
With software-defined data center, this could be a key enabler for the hybrid cloud architecture that we are talking about, and it is the future. And when we say hybrid cloud architecture, we're not only referring to technology. Technology and infrastructure is really a key component, but it's not only technology. It's also about application transformation. It's also about operation and how we are managing. And to be more specific, in order for us to build an effective hybrid cloud, we need to make sure that we have the right cloud enabling services where end users, they are free to browse the services that IT is offering. And they have the right to view through service catalog what are the services that they would like to subscribe with. And based on that, they are charged for it. And if they don't like it, they have the right to unsubscribe with that. And this is what we refer to cloud service enabling. And then we need to have cloud management. Cloud management means that we will be able to orchestrate the infrastructure. We're talking about complex setup. And no one can do it manually or, or otherwise I would have an army of IT. And this is again defeating the purpose of automation. So having a cloud management proper effective tool to manage orchestration, provisioning, resource utilization and resource allocation becomes so important. And then having the software defined data center and there are so many solutions for that. We need to make sure that we fit and pick the right solution for each organization. And the storage we have, file or object-based storage and network, there are so many varieties. But in EMC, what we believe is that you have two or three paths to build your hybrid cloud in a very quick and efficient way. The first is that you can leverage whatever infrastructure that you have. Because we realize that you have already made investment in servers, procuring servers, storage, network. And what we offer is that you can leverage that existing infrastructure that you already have. And we can build in 28 days a complete hybrid cloud infrastructure for you, provided that you have the right bill of material within your existing infrastructure. Or alternatively, you can opt to choose a complete converged, hyper-converged infrastructure that comes from factory pre-configured with all the hardware that you require, all the storage, the network, the servers. And in addition to that, on top of that, it's configured and engineered to offer you a ready to use hybrid cloud solution that you can immediately start migrating your workload into that hybrid cloud. So in summary, cloud computing is one of the mega trends that is happening now. And it is changing and forming, reforming the way we are managing IT. And as a matter of fact, it's changing the way we are behaving as individual as well as business. And it's our duties to make sure that we are leveraging this trend. And we are positioning our companies and ourselves as individual in the right context to secure our position in the future. And starting with private cloud, leveraging Later on, through the hybrid cloud, the power of the public cloud becomes so essential. But in addition to that, it's our duties as state of Kuwait, as government, to start building new offering around the government cloud, a trusted cloud that would encourage business to come and consume. And that will make it, once we have it, and once we have our hybrid cloud capabilities, become the offerings that government cloud can offer very sensible, very attractive, and very useful for us. Thank you for listening, and thank you for attending today with us. It was a great pleasure to be with you.